We are continuing our series this morning, and uh, I don't know about you, but I always like reading the end of the book. You know, I like the beginning of the book because it kind of sets the stage, but you know, you really want to get to the end of the book, and so we're, we're at the end of the book. There's only one other chapter left in the Bible, and so we're at the end, and uh, we're continuing our series, As It Is in Heaven. We're looking at the kingdom of God uh, and looking at it from uh, Jesus' definition. We've looked at what it is not. Uh, we've uh, explored that uh, as we looked at it last week. Uh, we we kind of get some misconceptions of what the kingdom of God is, and and uh, and so we want to be people of the kingdom. We want to know what the kingdom of God is, and this series is we're looking at that because we're to be praying that His kingdom come, His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And if we're to be praying that, we probably should be knowing what we're praying, what we're inviting into our world is the kingdom of God. Uh, so Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 8, and this is what it reads. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have the heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. This is the word of the Lord. Shall we give thanks this morning? Father, we thank you for your word this morning. God, we thank you for this future event. Lord, we thank you that uh, all that we hope for, all that we long for, will one day will not be faith, but it will be reality, and we will be living it. And Lord, we pray that you would speak to our hearts, encourage us, God, as we look at your kingdom. Lord, we pray that you would minister your truth to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The kingdom of God arrived with the first advent of Christ, but will be fully established at his second advent. Um, we're talking about the kingdom of God, and it was first brought... As a promise, the Messiah had been foretold that he would sit on the throne of his father David and all of this stuff, right? It was, they were longing for the Messiah. What we celebrate at Christmas time is the beginning of that, right? That, that God became flesh and dwelt among us. Um, we At our pizza movie night, the movie was a Christmas movie, right? It was fitting because it was snowing in the movie and we had just gotten snow the night before and we got snow yesterday. So it was just right and fitting. But uh, in the movie, he, the, the, the character talked about how God came down and became a baby to meet with us, right? That, that gift. And that's what we celebrate because he was ushering in his kingdom. But we also understand that it is also a future event that we're looking forward to, the, the full reality of God's kingdom. So it will be established as he comes the second time. He first came as uh, a baby born in a manger, humble, a servant who has come to die. But when he comes again, the second advent, we see that he comes with a crown on his head. It's not a crown of thorns. It's a crown of royalty. And he comes to establish the, the, the full reality of his kingdom. And we live in a time of his kingdom that it is the time that we are inviting others to join his kingdom. When he comes again and he fully realizes his kingdom, then it is too late for those that haven't come into his kingdom. And so this is why it's important that we know the kingdom, that we spread the kingdom by enlarging it, by inviting other people to join this great kingdom of our Lord. As people of the kingdom, we live with a present and future hope for what God is doing in his kingdom. We live in a already but not yet tension. 
Uh, this is the, 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 the tension that we live in. It, the kingdom of God is here, but it's not yet. Uh, this phrase has helped Christians understand the kingdom of God and, and really this, this stretch of, of existence that we have, that we are, his kingdom is being established, we are spreading it by, by being the light, by being his ambassadors, but we also understand that there is a future event that happens, that the full consummation of his kingdom will come. When the Lord Jesus came, he inaugurated the kingdom, and he preached about the kingdom, and he said that the kingdom of God is near, Matthew 4, 17. In fact, he said that the kingdom of God is within you. However, there is still this hope of, a, of the kingdom fulfillment when Christ returns and brings the full reality of what we're a part of uh, on display for the world to see. George Ladd, in Crucial Questions About the Kingdom of God, asserts, as the Messiahship of Christ involved two phases, a coming in humility to suffer and die, and a coming in power and glory to reign, so the kingdom is to be manifested in two realms, the present realm of righteousness or salvation, when men may accept or reject the kingdom, and the future realm, with the powers of the kingdom, shall be manifest in visible glory. The former was inaugurated in insignificant beginnings without outward display. Those who accept it are to live intermingled with those who reject it until the consummation. Then the kingdom will be disclosed in a mighty manifestation of power and glory. God's kingdom will come and the ultimate state will witness the perfect realization of the will of God everywhere forever. This tension is the already but not yet can be a blessing for us as believers. This kingdom that we're a part of is here, but it's also not yet fully realized is a blessing for us. For the kingdom is something that we are a part of now, and we will one day see it in all of its glory in the future. This is what we read in our text, that the consummation of the kingdom, the realization, it's no longer a hope, something that we're looking through the eyes of faith, but now will become a reality. We can experience the blessing and the promise of the kingdom because we know that no matter what is going on in the world today, we know that his kingdom will eventually come in all of its glory. Now you can't see the kingdom. Jesus said you can't say that it's there or here. But when that day comes, you will see and all flesh will see the kingdom of God. We begin living lives reflecting the kingdom. The reign of God has begun in the life of of a believer and we bring the kingdom of God into our community notice this they can never keep out the kingdom of God whether it's in schools whether it's in other public uh, places or even in the marketplace because wherever you are as a believer you are taking the kingdom of God with you think about that you are taking the kingdom of God, the reign of God with you wherever you go. In the midst of the darkness around us, you are a beacon of light because you are letting the light of Christ to shine through you. And other people see the value of the kingdom of God in you, and that's what is drawing them to the Lord. That is why we let our light shine, so that others may see the glory of God in us being displayed through us. So that they will come to salvation in Christ Jesus. So that they will say, I want to be a part of that kingdom. A good illustration of this already but not yet uh, tension that we live in is, is that of a, a pregnant lady. When a woman is pregnant, the baby is in the world, but the child has yet to be born. Think about this, right? Think about when, when your children were uh, babies inside either your womb or your wife's womb, right? And, and the, the child is developing. The, the, the little baby bump begins to grow and grow and grow. And you, 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 I remember for each one of our kids, the first time that we heard their heartbeat. I just sat there and thought, oh my goodness. I just, I'd never heard the baby's heartbeat ever. This is powerful and then when you see the sonograms and you know the, the technology today I mean you see the baby it's like 3D it's like and, and you see pictures of the sonogram and then the newborn and it's just amazing we lived right our kids were born right before that where you just had to trust that that was a baby that was on there it was a lot of squiggly it's like oh okay you say so right you had to have a lot of faith uh, they were convinced that that was the, the, the head, this was the arm. Okay, this is the, okay, sure. If you say so, there's faith. But you know, as the baby grows, you begin to sing to the baby, you begin to talk to the baby. Right? The baby is there. The baby is, is alive. It is a person. 
We speak to the baby. We start thinking of baby names. We start thinking about, you know, how you're going to decorate the, the child's room and all of those things. And, and the baby kicks. And that's the weirdest thing. If you've never seen a baby kick for that belly, and it's, I mean, it's like protruding. And it's like, there is a child in there. The baby is here, but not in all of its glory. Right? And so you wait. And it's great when, you know, it was great when Mandy was pregnant. And I'm sure that she thought it was great. But there comes a point when you want to see the realization of all that you hope for and long for. Yes, the baby is in the world, but you want the baby to be in all the reality of being birthed where you can hold it and touch it. And that's what we long for. That is the already but not yet. We see the effects of the kingdom. We can't see the kingdom with our eyes quite yet. But we know that there will be a day when he will be inaugurated into his kingdom. And we, the witnesses of all of that, will be around the throne worshiping the Lamb for all eternity. So this morning I want us to look briefly uh, in our text, so just really the first four verses, um, of what this kingdom is like. If this is our hope, if this is what we're longing for, uh, we should know what this kingdom looks like. And so the first that we see is the condition of the kingdom. In verse 1 it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth would have passed away, and the sea was no more. This kingdom is not a leftover kingdom. Aren't you glad for that? I hate leftovers. Unless it's like chili or soup or something along those lines. It just tastes better. But for the most part, leftovers, it just doesn't taste as good as when you first had it. Understand that this kingdom is not a leftover kingdom. We're not getting scraps from something else. He is creating a new heaven and a new earth. John saw a new heaven and a new earth. And this is a great earth. It's a beautiful planet. But it won't be anything compared to what God has prepared for us. This new heaven and new earth has not been contaminated by sin like ours. Now think about this. If this planet is so beautiful and has been affected by and contaminated by sin, what is the new heaven and the new earth going to look like? I mean, just stop and think about that reality. So notice that this new heaven and this new earth or the two words, I should say, has no sea. Now, for us, that doesn't mean much. We're like, we just kind of read on. We just think of new heaven and new earth. But John makes it very clear that he sees that there is no sea in this new earth. And the importance and the significance of this is that the sea often carried a, no, a notion of agitation, fear, and chaos. We look at the ocean and we look at the sea and we think paradise, right? We think sitting on the beach enjoying getting some vitamin D, right, and just enjoying it. But in the first century, in the ancient world, the sea often carried with it uh, a, a notion of agitation, fear, chaos, anxiety. That's why when the disciples were in the boat and the storm came upon them on, on the sea, they were troubled and they were afraid because it represented the abyss. So when John saw that there was no sea in this new earth, the significance is that the kingdom of God, there is no fear and chaos. Think about that. This kingdom, there is no fear. There is no chaos. There is no anxiety or troubles in the kingdom. That's a beautiful thought. We live in a world full of troubles and in problems and anxiety and cares and, and uh, literally chaos all around. Uh, we can't fix problems in our world because they're so complicated because when you start tinkling with one and then something else triggers it and it, it just, I mean, it's, it, the more that we try to fix our planet and our earth and our, our society, the more it just kind of crumbles around us. There's so much fear and anxiety. But in his kingdom, there is no fear, no anxiety. The second thing that we see about this kingdom is that the kingdom is holy. Verse 2, he writes, And I saw the holy city New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. This is a holy kingdom. This isn't a, uh, a, an average, ordinary kingdom. This is a kingdom that's been set apart. Holy means to be set apart, sacred, pure, and morally blameless. This isn't like any other kingdom because it is a sacred kingdom. 
It's a kingdom of priests unto God, 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. And I love how John describes this city, this kingdom coming, as a bride adorned for her husband. Guys, think about on your wedding day, when you saw your bride for the first time, as she has adorned herself for you, right? Maybe you were uh, at the, the front of the church, or maybe there's a gazebo, or you're out on the beach. Wherever you were, there you were with the minister, and lo and behold, your bride, who has adorned herself for you, begins to walk down the aisle. Remember that day? Oh, my wife is beautiful, but boy, that wedding day. Oh, there was a glow about her. There was a glory that came over her that just, I was utterly speechless as she was walking down the aisle. The first time I saw, it was just a silhouette. And as she came closer to me, I would begin to see her face, and she was absolutely gorgeous. And she still is. She comes down, and I'm just, I, I'm shaking. I mean, I was nervous. I mean, think about that. You know, it just this is the this is the description that John gives of the new Jerusalem as a bride who has adorned herself for her husband. Beautiful, holy is this kingdom. The third thing that we see is its most prominent feature. In verse three, he writes, "And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man.'" He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. What makes this kingdom so glorious isn't that there's no you know, a crystal sea or there, there's a, the streets of gold. What makes this kingdom so glorious is that God Almighty dwells in the midst of the kingdom. He is the main prominent feature of this kingdom. He's what makes the gold glitter. He's what makes heaven so wonderful. It is that he is there with his people. And we will be with him forever. The very thing that sin attempted to create, separation from God and his people, will be no more. Think about that. From the time of the garden incident, God desired fellowship with Adam. That's why he made this beautiful garden and he put Adam in the middle of it and he wanted relationship with Adam. He wanted to converse with Adam and yet because of sin, Adam took of the fruit and rebelled against God and was separated with, from God. Right? He was separated physically because he was kicked out of that wonderful garden. And unless he come back in, there was a, the sword with the angel there guarding it. He was forever separated from God. But God's heart and his desire to be with mankind never stopped just because we sinned. And throughout the Old Testament, the heart of God was to be with his people. On Sunday nights, we're looking at the tabernacle, and that is a very, the, the very embodiment of God's desire. The tabernacle was smack dab in the middle of the camp. You had different tribes, and they were assigned around the tabernacle. Why? Because God wanted to be there, right in the middle of his people. It wasn't like God was saying, okay, you guys camp over here, and I'm just going to be over here, and if you need me, just come out. No, it was right in the middle of the camp. Why? Because he was telling his people and teaching them that he wants to be with them. And all too often, like us, God wants to be with us more than we want to be with him. He puts himself smack dab in the middle of our lives, and we try to put God on the outskirts of our lives. But God's desire is to be right there with us, and not just be in the, in the midst of us, but to be in us, to, to be his dwelling place. He doesn't want to live in a temple, in a building made of bricks and mortar. He wants to live within us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's how close he wants to get to us. Not just be associated with us, but to be with us. And here are some scripture references. I'm not going to read them because there's so many. And this is just scratching the surface. So if you're taking notes, you can write them down. Scripture references that display God's desire to dwell with his people. Exodus 29, 46. Leviticus 26, 11. Numbers 35, 34. 1 Kings 6, 13. Ezekiel 37, 27. 
chapter 47 and 7 and 9 of Ezekiel and Zechariah 2, 10, and 11. There's more. I could have filled more a page of them, but these are just a snapshot of scripture references that talk about God's desire to be with his people. Again, he's repeating himself because we're a little slow on the uptake of what we of what we think God wants. We think God wants just our lip service. He doesn't want just our lip service. He wants us. We think God just wants our, our offering. He doesn't want our offering. He wants us. We think that he wants all of these things, but what he really wants is you and me. He doesn't want to know about us. He wants to know us. He wants to be a part of our lives and that he is the center of our lives. The fourth thing that we see. I'm sorry. When we go back, I forgot this one last comment. The heart of God from the beginning was to dwell among his people. And when his kingdom is fully espoused and installed, God will get his desires. It's been his desire that nothing separates us from his presence. And when his kingdom is fully installed, he will get what he wants. Aren't you glad for that? Because he wants us. And we, we don't deserve it. We are recipients of God's great love. And we become his people. And we are with him for all eternity. The fourth thing that we see about his kingdom is this. The effect of the power of his kingdom. In verse 4 it says, He will wipe away every tear from in their eyes. And death shall be no more. Let me read that again. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. This is a powerful verse. Maybe you've been touched and shed tears of grief and mourning and pain. Maybe you've been touched by death, and it hurts. This kingdom... Think about it. There will be none of those things. As we sing this, those hymns, there will be no party over there. What a day that will be. What is that song talking about? It's talking about what we're saying about here today. This kingdom comes and all of its reality. That is the hope. We're touched by death. We're touched by calamity. We're touched by grief and we cry and we, we mourn. But in his kingdom, all of those things are gone. They passed away. We have this confident expectation that God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. That literally means those things, death, pain, hurt, grief, loss, that brought those tears to our eyes as we cried out in anguish will be wiped away. It will be blotted away. No more death, no more grief, no more pain, anguish, hurt will never touch us. It's hard for us to even begin to fathom that because we are so touched by those things. Maybe you came here this morning with grief in your heart. Maybe some of that anguish and that pain has touched you. And maybe recently you've cried out in anguish and hurt and pain. Understand this, the hope that we have in Christ, that when his kingdom has fully come and fully realized, all of those things will be no more. For the former things have passed away. That which sin brought into the world will be gone once and for all. In his kingdom, there will be no crying over there. That word cry literally means outcry of grief and clamor. It's not just the tears, it's the, it's the pain and the anguish associated with the tears. Because I'm sure there will be tears in heaven. There will be happy tears. There will be tears of joy, tears of love. This, we can't even begin to fathom what we will be experiencing when we enter into the fullness of his kingdom and we see our great king standing before us with his nail-pierced hands extended to us, welcoming us into his kingdom. There will be tears, but they won't be the cry of pain and anguish. It will be the, uh, the tears of joy and love and adoration given to the one who made it possible for us to be there with him. And finally, we see in his kingdom that it is all accomplished by God. Verse 5, And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. All of this is possible because of the Lord Jesus. Our hope is built on the solid rock of Christ Jesus. He is, as the writer of Hebrews declares, that we are looking for that city whose founder and whose designer and builder is God. 
He is the one who designed it. He is the one who founded it. He is the builder. He is the reason why it exists. And it's for him and it's by him that it exists. Just the same as you and I, that we were created for him and by him for his pleasure, that we have this relationship with him. As we close, we live in that between the already but not yet. We know that we are to advance his kingdom for we are his ambassadors, compelling folks to turn from their sin. Our text promises that for those who are thirsty, the Lord Jesus will give them the water of life. Right? He says that he will give them the springs of the water without payment. But there's also this warning from our king. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with eternal fire and sulfur, which is the second death. It's almost as if what we see here is a final plea for those who will be reading these words for the centuries after they were written. This hope that we have, this glory that will be ours if we receive our king's invitation. But there comes with a warning that if we reject that invitation, that there is an eternal punishment that's awaiting. Our message is one of hope because there is no reason why anyone should ever experience the second death. No reason. The price has been paid for us to enter into his kingdom, to see the reality of his glory and his grace for all eternity. And as we are the people of his kingdom, it must be our desire to see others submit to his lordship. We must call them to repentance so that the kingdom of God may enter within them. So that they may look in anticipation, like you and I do, for the full reality and the realization of his kingdom as it will come in that day. That we point others and invite others to accept that invitation from the king to be a part of his kingdom. So that we, along with others, as Revelation says, people from every tongue, tribe, and nation, gathering around the throne and worshiping the lamb who was slain. An innumerable multitude, the scripture says. And it's our privilege as citizens of that kingdom to go and invite others and have them put their citizenship in that kingdom too. How great it will be to be in that kingdom, to be around the throne and to see the glory of Jesus in all of his majesty. And there beside you is your family. People we go to church with, friends, all together, worshiping the one who saved us. That's our desire. That's his desire, and that's what he's called us to. Amen? Would you join me in prayer this morning? Father, that is the heart of each one of us this morning. Lord, we look forward in anticipation to the full reality and the realization of your kingdom. The Lord, to be your people, to be around your throne, to worship you, to be with you forever. Lord, we long for that. But Lord, we are also very much aware that there are people that are close to us. That Lord, they haven't accepted your invitation to be a part of your kingdom. Lord, we thank you that we're living in this, this tension. Because it gives opportunity for people to put their faith in Christ. Lord, we pray that you would use us. That, Lord, we would shine forth the glory of your kingdom, the glory of your Son to the world around us. So that they would see how great and how glorious and how wonderful and kind and generous you are. That, Lord, they would be drawn to you. And that, Lord, we would point the way to the cross. So that they may repent of their sin and turn to you. So that they, too, may have the kingdom of God living and dwelling within them. So that they, too, would join us as we surround your throne on that day to worship the Lamb. Our Lord, your kingdom would grow and expand. And Father, we do pray that your kingdom would come here on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the majestic name of Jesus, amen and amen.